Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the workers' meeting tonight. Thank you for all your sons, daughters, servants, our leaders. We bless your name for all the workers who are gathered everywhere, in every location, in Nigeria, outside Nigeria, in Africa and beyond. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you open our eyes to see wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, it will not be meeting, training as usual, but that, Lord, you speak directly, pointedly to every heart in Jesus' name. I will pray that we will not go back home the same way we came in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Luke chapter 7. And we're reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 7, verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the ears of her head. Tonight, as we look at the story surrounding this verse, we find important personalities surrounding the verse. Number one, Christ himself. Christ our Lord, Christ our Savior, and Christ the very center of the event. Number two, we find Simon, the landlord there, who had invited Jesus as a guest. He was being hospitable. Because of that, he invited the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wanted to have a meal with the Lord and his disciples. Number three, the woman who was a sinner that came to that situation and felt the burden of her sin and urge conviction as well as contrition and because of that she gave expression to her conviction being a sinner wanting the forgiveness of the lord and wanting peace with god we find number four those who are not mentioned because they were quiet the disciples of the lord jesus christ they were present because they went with the Lord Jesus Christ to the house of this Pharisee. Number five, other people that were there, apart from those who had mentioned, who were critical in their hearts. Now, as we look at that situation, we find ourselves being, being represented by some of them. Some people are like Simon and they do not create a conducive environment for a sinner to repent, for a sinner to unburden a heart before the Lord and seek forgiveness, peace of mind and salvation. Other people are like the disciples. They are quiet. They might be quietly praying. When you are in the house fellowship, somebody is teaching. You are in the church, somebody is preaching, or you are in a particular situation like a crusade when the preacher is declaring the word of God. Hopefully you are there as a believer and you are an intercessor, a quiet intercessor that sinners will come to the Lord, that sinners will be broken down, that sinners will be convicted, that sinners will find that day, that moment, their day of salvation and their moment of coming into the kingdom of God. 
generally when you go to witness there might be two of you that go together to witness while one is talking while one is preaching the other one a partner to that soul winner to be praying quietly that the lord will leave the person talking that the watch will get straight into their heart and that repentance will come out of this message and they'll believe on the lord jesus christ while somebody is preaching the other one is praying that's the attitude we ought to have like those disciples who are quiet now there are other people that will be there with a critical spirit a critical attitude they expect the event to be just the normal event they expect the service to be just the regular service they expect the worship time to be the regular worship time and if anything unusual takes place that somebody is crying somebody is a body or somebody is confessing his sin or somebody is speaking out loud and praying out loud and shedding tears they're critical they do not understand the conviction or the thing that had come upon the sinner and so you find yourself in one of those situations and I pray that God will give us the grace to be sensitive as children of God so that anywhere we are will create a conducive atmosphere environment for sinners to repent and for sinners to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. As we look at the story tonight, we're talking about forgiveness and peace from Christ our Savior. Forgiveness and peace from Christ our Savior. The message is divided to three parts. Number one, the forgetful fault finding, the forgetfulness, fault finding, and pride of Simon. Simon is a Pharisee. Simon is the religious person. Simon is the one that knew Christ to the point of inviting Christ to his house, but not to his heart. Pride cut him off from actually having proper connection and total conversion unto the Lord. He had forgetfulness. He had fault finding as his, as his part, part of his life and pride in his heart. Point number two, the foundation of forgiveness and peace from the Savior. This woman came and eventually Christ said, your faith has made thee whole, go in peace. The foundation of forgiveness and peace from the Savior. Point number three, our faith in his faithfulness as the provider of salvation. Christ, the provider of salvation, told her, your many sins are forgiven. She had faith in the faithfulness of the provider of salvation. Go home, your faith has saved you. She had faith in the faithfulness of the provider of salvation. You can now go back home in peace. All the condemnation of sin is gone. And she believed that. And went back home with forgiveness, with salvation, and with the peace of God. If we're going to get something from the Lord, we must understand Christ is the provider. The provider of salvation. The provider of healing the provider of sanctification and the provider of the grace of God that is sufficient for our lives. And we must have faith in the faithfulness of the provider. Let's come to point number one, the forgetfulness and fault finding and pride of Simon. We're looking at Luke chapter seven, reading from verse 36. In Luke chapter seven, reading from verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when 
she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster box of ointment verse 38 and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the ears of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment verse 39 now when the pharisee which had bidden him saw it he spake within himself saying this man if he were a prophet would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him for she is a sinner as you read that and you look at the situation you need to ask yourself if you were there what would have been your attitude your reaction or your response obviously number one the woman came as she was the sinner came as she was she didn't come pretending she didn't come with hypocrisy she didn't come like one of the people of God she was a sinner and she came as a sinner obviously from what we have read she didn't cover her head obviously from what we have read she didn't follow any religious rule or decorum in the presence of the Pharisee in the presence of the disciples a church like ours might become guilty that even though we know Christ is Savior and we know that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that we are to be the bridge between sinners and the Savior yet we can become so guilty that when sinners come and they come just as they are we look at those sinners physically, outwardly. That lady is not covering her head. And the thing that concerns some people is to run after her and find something to cover her head and tell her, you must cover your head. Christ didn't say that. A sinner she was. She came as a sinner. She acted as a sinner. And the Lord accepted her as a sinner. And none of the disciples acted like an impromptu usher. That will say, although I'm not an usher, but this situation, I must correct it now. And then run and find something for her to cover her head. Not only that, when she was getting near Christ, and kneeling on the ground and weeping and the tears were dropping at the feet of Jesus none of the disciples felt they should pull her away from there we can easily destroy the conviction or stop the conviction of a sinner if a sinner apart from being convicted is doing something in line with her conviction in line with the condemnation of her sin that is not acceptable to the believers who are there we can easily rush there and say get out of that place the lord the savior is higher than that and is you know holy and perfect people like you should not come and touch him and then she, they can drag her away there are many people that will do that and instead of becoming a bridge between the sinner and the savior they become a barrier you must ask yourself as you look at the way we come to worship and the people that come 
do sinners ever come to our church as they are have you ever seen and if you see do you ever allow do you ever invite a sinner who is a real sinner and allow her to come and not give her rules and regulation and give her the doctrine for the believer while she's still an unbeliever and then she comes have you ever seen people coming to a church with their earrings on have you ever seen them with their paintings have you ever seen them with their heads uncovered have you ever seen them those ladies wearing slacks why haven't you seen them because you don't invite them because you don't think people like that shall come into the house of God when it is deep alive. Have you ever seen a man with their beards? Have you ever seen a man that obviously outwardly they dress, they appear like sinners? Do you allow them? But you see, the uh, disciples did not disturb the woman. And here is what we need to learn that if sinners are going to be converted we must bring them the way they are to the presence of the Savior we must allow them to express themselves the way they feel to express themselves and allow the conviction of the Word of God to drive them to the Savior many of us might be guilty like Simon the Pharisee now this Simon the Pharisee let's look at his life and let's look at what he presents to us number one Simon's perception of Christ as a man look at verse 39 Luke chapter 7 verse 39 it says now when the pharisee which had bidden him saw it he spake within himself saying this man stop there for a moment that was a problem he saw the lord jesus christ as this man he didn't see him as god as a son of god as a savior of the world as the sinless spotless perfect lamb of god that came to take the sin of the world away he saw him as this man look at matthew chapter 9 reading from verse 3 in matthew chapter 9 verse 3 and behold certain of the scribes said within themselves this man blasphemous because of the way they saw christ this man and they didn't think beyond being human they didn't look at his divinity they didn't look at the fact that he came for this purpose came him he into the world to save sinners this man look at john chapter 9 verse 24 in john chapter 9 reading from verse 24 then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him give glory give god the praise we know that this man is a sinner you are talking about jesus and when you think of christ even yourself that now you are reading the story and as you are reading the story christ sat there as he sat there this woman came and was weeping and was touching the lord jesus christ weeping on her feet on his feet and wiping the tears with the ears of his of her head you even as a believer if you were not under the control of the spirit of god you might say but why did christ allow this did it have he, he have the feeling of being lured into sin by a woman like this can i do that 
You are comparing yourself with Christ. You are man. He is God. He is the Son of God. Tempted in every way and yet without sin. For he was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. It was impossible for him to sin. He is God. And so the first mistake is the perception of Simon because he thought of Christ as a man, mere man. Come to second point here. Second point, sinless perfection of Christ above men. Christ was sinless in his nature. His flesh was not like our flesh. His nature was not like our nature. His feeling was not like our feeling. I and my father are one. Himself was like the heavenly father. And this woman was his creature. He made, he created the woman and created all people. And so the woman, the creature, acted in repentance and in penitence towards her creator sinless perfection of christ above men hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 in hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 for such an high priest christ became us who is holy always holy harmless always harmless undefiled always undefiled separate from sinners always separate from sinners made higher than the heavens that's so christ was that's so christ is matthew chapter 1 verse 23 in matthew chapter 1 verse 23 behold a virgin shall conceive shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name everybody tell me Emmanuel which being interpreted is say it aloud God with us when Christ came to this world he came as Emmanuel God with us and he was sinless and he was perfect above all men number three now so saving propitiation in christ the messiah he came as the son of god he came as the savior he came as the messiah the messiah in romans chapter 3 reading from verse 23 romans chapter 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When it says all have sinned, that exempts Christ. When it says and come short of the glory of God, that exempts Christ. He said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I add with you from the foundation of the world. That means Christ had glory and he remains in that glory. But he came to save sinners in verse 24. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing of sins, of the sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The Pharisee didn't understand that. Simon didn't understand that. That is why he was forgetful. 
That's why he was fault finding. That's why he was proud and was thinking in his heart, is this man a prophet? If he were a prophet, he would have known that this woman is a sinner. Of course he knew. That's exactly why he came. He came to save us sinners. He came to this world for such woman, a woman like that woman. We'll come to point number two now. The foundation of forgiveness and peace from the Savior. We're coming to Luke chapter 7, reading from verse 47. Wherefore I say unto thee, as sins which are many are forgiven. Stop there for a moment. The Pharisees thought that Jesus did not know the woman as a sinner. Of course, Jesus knew. And Jesus even knew that her sins are many. But now they are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven. The same loves little. Look at verse 48. In verse 48, and he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. Reading from verse 49 now. And they that search at meet with him. That's why I said at the beginning, there were other people there apart from Christ, apart from Simon, apart from the woman. The people that search at meet with him began to say, within themselves who is this those are not the disciples the apostles the disciples will never question christ forgiving the sins of sinners these were others outsiders saying who is this that forgives sins also and now in verse 50 and he said to the woman thy faith I save thee, go in peace. The foundation of forgiveness and peace from the Savior. Three, three, three things we're looking at. Number one, conviction and sorrow for sin. Number two, confession and separation from all sins. Number three, conversion and submission to the Savior. Look at number one. Number one, conviction and sorrow for sin. In Luke chapter 7, verse 37. Luke chapter 7, verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus searched at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and, went, and did wipe them with the ears of her head and kissed the feet and anointed them with the ointment. Number one, we see the conviction. But you see, Christ had not said anything. You are right. When Isaiah saw the glory of God and the angels crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord and the foundations of the temple moved at the sound of their praise immediately when Isaiah became conscious of the holiness of God he became conscious of his own situation and he said woe is me I am undone I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people 
of unclean lips when john the beloved saw christ on the isle of patmos and saw the blazing glory of the lord he fell as one dead when saul of tassos heard the voice and also saw the bright light shining from heaven he fell down and he said lord what will you have me to do when you come in the presence of christ holy righteous sparkling white perfect even if you were not conscious of your sin before the very presence of the holy righteous perfect son of god will bring the remembrance of your sin in your heart you'll be broken down how can somebody come to the presence of god how can somebody open the scriptures how can somebody read the scriptures how can somebody be ministered to by the holy spirit and he never feels the conviction of his sin there are many people that come to the presence of the lord the see those who are saved the see those who are sanctified the see those who are holy and they also are ministered to in the word of god that should bring conviction and yet they never feel any conviction they are dead in their sin they stay near fire and they cannot feel the heat of the fire this woman felt the conviction of her sin and then she began uncontrollably to weep because of her sin the conviction brought sorrow for sin when we hear the word of god if we have heard aright we will not be smiling jesting rejoicing and thinking that everything is all right if there is sin in our lives there will be conviction and sorrow for sin we're looking at second corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 in second corinthians chapter 7 reading from verse 10 for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation godly sorrow if there's real conviction it will lead to sorrow of heart it will lead to regret how could i have been like that how could i have been doing that why was my life habitually going the wrong direction how could i have been carrying the bible around and yet i did not live the way a child of god ought to live how could i be hearing all these messages and i hear and i rise up and i go my way when your moment comes to respond to the lord your life will make you sorrowful there will be that conviction and godly sorrow will work repentance to salvation and that repentance that godly sorrow that will lead you on your knees that will drive you to your knees is not to be repented of it's not to be regretted of like the sorrow of the world that walketh days matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 4 in matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 4 blessed a day that morn you see your wretchedness she saw her wretchedness she saw her own depravity she saw her defilement she saw the life a degrading life she was living and because of that she mourned as if somebody had died because her spirit was had died her soul had died a relationship with god was nowhere to be found and because she was dead in sins and trespasses and she realized that she mourned she wept she was sorrowful and blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted number two number two is confession and separation from all 
sees it would be hypocritical to cry that somebody says i'm a sinner and i'm weeping and after weeping will go back to the scene it would be hypocritical for somebody to come before christ and be shedding tears crocodile tears and that person does not have any mind of separation from his or her sins but this woman was not hypocritical and christ knew and because he knew that this is genuine these tears are coming from a broken heart and from a repentant heart that's why jesus said your sins which are many are all forgiven when we preach the word of god and then somebody is under the conviction of the holy spirit and remembers and recollects all that he or she had been doing and the fellow begins to cry there are some preachers there are some soul winners one on one that will say don't cry jesus loves you don't be sorrowful jesus loves you don't regret that you are being like that god knows that he knows the day you'll be converted he allowed you to go here and to go there and to go there and to do everything that you did so don't be sorrowful christ did not say don't be sorrowful the disciples did not say don't cry and the word of god says when people are sorrowful like that that godly sorrow would lead them to repentance which leads them to salvation and the blessedness of those that mourn for their sin the blessedness will come they'll be comforted with forgiveness and with the salvation of god proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 in proverbs 28 verse 13 he that covereth his sin shall not prosper but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy acts chapter 5 verse 31 in acts chapter 5 reading from verse 31 him as god exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins actually genuine repentance is the work of the holy spirit when he is come he will convict the world of sin as this woman came there the holy spirit began his ministry on the woman and reminded her of his sin you are coming to christ you are not coming for entertainment you are coming to the savior here is the pure one he doesn't really need you but you need him it's not like a man that all the other men you've been giving yourself to this is the one that can turn your life around that can change your life and the holy spirit began to remind her who she was i know she can be the transformation the conversion that will come that will come that's why she broke down and the lord himself gave her repentance in order to give her forgiveness that's what the lord does when we come to the presence of the lord the love of god and the ministry of the holy spirit will break the heart will bring conviction and as we go to the foot of the cross then repentance will turn to regeneration forgiveness of sin look at number three number three is conversion and submission to the savior conversion and submission to the savior we're looking at acts chapter 3 we're reading from verse 19 
Acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted in the normal uh, way of uh, the New Testament repentance leads to conversion if there is no disturbance after that repentance if there's no distraction after that repentance if nobody comes in between the sinner and the savior if nobody comes to give in speedy comfort don't cry don't cry don't be sorrowful and don't think about sin think about the love of god if nobody comes to give that kind of cheap comfort normally repentance will lead to conversion repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the lord and then in verse 26 verse 26 tells us unto you first god having raised up his son jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities we're looking at james chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 19 james chapter 5 verse 19 brethren if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him. Verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is talking about somebody who had been one of the brethren. Any of you brethren that means he went into error because it says he shall come he shall be converted that sinner from the error of his way now a believer who is still standing goes after him or goes after her and he does not give false comfort false sympathy it tells the person who has gone, you are gone. Prodigal son, prodigal daughter. But look at what is happening to you. Look at your life. This is not God's will for you. And this is not God's expectation of you. Everything you took with you, when you wage into the far country look at where you are today what can you say that spiritually you have gained all the years you have been in the far country you speak persuasively you speak convincingly and you speak with conviction and you speak with concern and so brethren if any of you verse 19 in verse 19 if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him and one conver com uh, convinces him and one brings conviction upon him and then he brings him to christ understand not just to church where well, people who have been brought to the church but they have not been brought to Christ. There's no conviction. There's no conversion. There's no contrition. There's no sorrow for sin. There is nothing that says, I am not what I ought to be. And such people who come to church and they do not come to Christ, they do not eventually turn or change from what they had been in the far country as they come to the church they just come with excitement and joy and they say i'm back you know how about all those years that have been wasted in sin i'm not even thinking of that are you sorry at all i'm not sorrowful at all 
we still need to help them in prayer that the Holy Spirit will do what he ought to do and bring real com conviction and now in verse 20 it says let him know let him know that he which converted the sinner that's the prodigal son that's the prodigal daughter from the error of his way shall save his soul from death the implication is if that prodigal son if that prodigal daughter does not come back to christ even if he comes to church if that prodigal person does not come back to christ in full surrender and full salvation he will still perish in death spiritual death but when he comes and when he's converted you'll save the soul from death and you'll hide a multitude of sins look at we're coming to point number three now in point number three we have a faith in the faithfulness of the provider of salvation here is christ and is the savior is the provider of salvation and once he says you are saved you are saved the pharisee may question but you are saved and the other people there might say why does this man blaspheme you're saved you might have good feeling you might have neutral feeling but he says you are saved you are saved our salvation is not based on our feeling it's not based on our emotion it's not based on our excitement it's not based on uh, exceeding joy and gladness all those things may come joy excitement and then we might feel light as if you are walking uh, in the mid-air all that might come uh, but our salvation does not depend on the feeling uh, on the emotion it depends on what the provider of salvation has said that's why this woman without thinking of her feeling without thinking of her excitement without looking at the face of the disciples whether they accepted her or not without looking at the statement of the pharisee a statement of rejection they reject me they don't accept me they don't welcome me and i feel isolated i feel rejected all that did not affect our salvation our salvation depended on the statement of the provider of salvation how about you when the lord has seen that you have repented the lord saw that you have sincerely called on the name of the lord and whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved and you called and you were sincere and you were genuine and you broke down and you repented of your sin and you looked up to the lord oh lord all i want is real salvation the kind of salvation that will get me to heaven that's all you need and then christ says your sins are forgiven that's enough that's enough you have faith in the faithfulness of the provider of salvation look at that thief on the cross and he said lord remember me when you come to your kingdom we don't know what the man had had before of the tradition of the pharisees of the tradition of religion we don't know what he knew about water baptism we don't know whether he had met some people that were preaching the real gospel before and now she went astray and committed a crime hanging on the cross and then he said lord remember me when you come to your kingdom he knew him to be lord he knew that he had a kingdom he knew that he was the only one that could get him into the kingdom and he said remember me and jesus said today 
Verily I say unto you today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. The giver of salvation has spoken. The provider of salvation has spoken. The man was still on the cross. The man was still feeling the pain of nailing him to the cross. The man did not have anybody coming to show any favor, bring him down from the cross. The soldiers still came and they were going to throw a javelin at him so he can die quickly. All those things will not matter. All the pain, all the feeling, all the surrounding, hanging on the cross, all the feeling will not matter once the provider of salvation has spoken. Your faith in the Savior hangs on the word of the provider of salvation. Faith in the faithfulness of the provider of salvation. Look at three things said. Number one, faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. Two, fellowship and followership of the saints. Three, fishing without falling back into sin. Number one, faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. Let's come to Luke chapter 7, verse 48. And he said unto her, and he said unto her, you'll be confronted with the statements of other people. You'll be confronted with the jeerings and the mockings of other people. You'll be confronted with the doubts of other people. You'll be confronted with the placid look of other people. But one thing you need to concentrate on, what has the Savior said? What has the Lord said? And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. That settles it. That's salvation. The Savior is faithful. And whatever the Savior says, the Father has said, I and my Father are one. They never disagreed. If the Son said, Thy sins are forgiven, the Father has said the same thing. Look at verse 50. In verse 50, and he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. Condemnation is gone. Judgment is gone. All the sins that were written down, they are blotted out. You will never be called into question. You will never come into judgment anymore. For all the sins you have committed, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Whatever anybody says when you go outside, Whatever condemnation they try to heap on you and whatever any sin partner of the past might say when they come and confront you, the provider of salvation has spoken, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. And she believed and she accepted. That is the beauty of faith and the glory of faith. And the grace that God gives that we have faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. In Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9, it says that if thou is not turning away from the woman, the woman is settled. Is now turning to everyone, each of us, and it says, Now, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, your own heart. Not another person's heart, not another person's feeling, not another person's comment, 
not another person's approval, not another person's confirmation. You don't have to depend on the confirmation of another person. Am I saved? And then you go and ask another person, do you think, do you feel I am saved? You don't have to depend on another person for with your own heart you believe unto righteousness and with the mouth, your own mouth, confession is made unto salvation because of your faith in the faithfulness of the Savior. Let's come to point number two there. Number three is the fellowship and followership with the saints. For this woman, we do not know what came after because the chapter terminates in verse 15. But we know that since the Lord gave us salvation, and it is not a one day salvation, a one week salvation, a salvation through and through. We know that as the Lord said, go. That word go is not a word of a moment. Keep on going and keep on going and keep on enjoying the peace that comes with salvation. But for the other, other people on record that will follow them after the moment of their salvation, we know what follows in Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 40. Fellowship and followership with the saints in Acts chapter 2 verse 40 and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this unto a generation verse 41 then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Look up here for a moment. To continue means go and keep on going. It means walk and keep on walking and you know nobody can make you walk it's coming from your heart it's coming from your decision you know that you have received your forgiveness you have received your salvation that's the commencement of that life in christ now you keep on going and going you are walking, you are walking, just like it takes your own free volition to walk. It takes your free volition to, to keep on walking and living in the salvation that God, that Christ has given. And these ones continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. I pray every one of us like the lord has given us grace and we have been walking with the lord you will continue till the end in jesus name number three now number three is fishing without falling back into sin when the lord has forgiven anyone and the lord has brought salvation to anyone he wants that person to go and tell a friend, go and tell a relation, go and tell a neighbor, go and tell other people that you know were in the same boat which you before. But now you have known Christ and you have known a salvation. You go and fish, but you will not fall into the old seas with them. Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 19. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and it says unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In verse 20, it says, And they straightway let their nets and followed him. Let their nets and followed him. 
He wants you to be a fisher of men. But he doesn't want you falling back into their sin. John chapter 4, reading from verse 28. John chapter 4, verse 28. The woman then led her water porch and went her way into the city and says to the men, he said to the men, verse 29, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? The woman went to the men, not to do what they were doing together before, but to invite them now, not to her house, not to herself, not to her body, but to Christ her Savior and said come come and see the man that told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ and in verse 30 in verse 30 then they went out of the city and came unto him not unto her unto him you come, you are now a fisher of men And you are fishing men out of the sea of humanity And you are bringing them to Christ And you continue following the Lord As we have the peace of God He wants us to make progress in that salvation You remember the cross, peace, purity, power he gives unto us mine, mine in the Lord, mine, mine in the Lord. Peace at salvation. Make progress, purity at sanctification. Make progress, power in the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Make progress, become witnesses unto Him. Peace, purity, power, yours in the Lord. I said, yours in the Lord. And remember, your peace of mind, your purity in your spirit, and the power of the Lord depends on what the Savior has said. Your faith in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything He has provided on the cross of Calvary will be yours in Jesus' name. Dear mine, I said, Dear mine. Stand up and receive more of the goodness of the grace of God in your life. Peace is yours, purity is yours, power is yours, provision is yours, all the promise and all the provision of Calvary, everything belongs to you. He said so, he said so, so it is in your life in Jesus' name.